Hi, this is Nick Freitas, and welcome back to Making the Argument. Today, we're gonna to be talking about HR1. Now, what is HR1, you may ask? Well, I'm so glad you asked. HR1 is the For the People Act. That's right, it's For the People Act. And I, I'm assuming it was named this so that if anybody votes against it, they could say, oh my gosh, clearly you're not for the people because that's how this sort of sophistry exists within political discourse now. Just name a bill something you know, really nice and sweet, lollipops and puppy dogs, and if anybody votes against it, you can trash them for being against the people. But the real question is, is what does the For the People Act actually do? Right, what does it actually do? Now I'm gonna read for you a, a couple of things. One's, one comes directly from HR1, right? And one comes from somebody that's a supporter of HR1. So let's read what HR1 says. It says, the purpose is to expand America's access to the ballot box, reduce the influence of big money in politics, strengthen ethics rules for public servants, and implement other anti-corruption measures for the purpose of fortifying our democracy and for other purposes. I like how they added the end for other purposes at the end there. I guess that's the all-inclusive empty bucket that you can put anything you want into. All right, so that, that all sounds good, right? right? But those are the stated intentions of HR1. And as we've discussed before on this, process, or on this uh, podcast, as legislators, we don't write intentions. We write laws, right? And laws come with coercive authority, right? It comes with the power for law enforcement to go out there and actually enforce these laws and penalties for noncompliance, right? But that's the stated intention behind the For the People Act. Let's look at what John Sarbanes had to say about it. He said, if we could get the reforms that are embodied in HR1 into law, it would be absolutely transformational. He's actually correct on this, but not on the way he thinks. It would be the most robust, kind of breathtaking set of reforms that we've seen in two generations. And it would, in a way, with a kind of quantum leap, it would push our democracy toward a place where Americans could feel faith again and restore their trust in how we operate. Except that it won't. Right, like that, that's the only problem with that statement is it said that it won't do that or it'll only do that for certain voters. And as you can imagine, it's probably not conservative voters. So if you're someone that takes election integrity seriously, chances are you're gonna hate this bill. I'm gonna give you a number of reasons why. Right? We're gonna go through all the whys. There's like a good you know, top six reasons that we're gonna talk about it, why this bill is problematic and will do anything but restore faith for a lot of Americans, I would say tens of millions of Americans that voted in the last election cycle. This, this addresses none of your concerns. In fact, it enshrines into law a number of the things that we have legitimate concerns over. But of course, the moment we talk about a concern about election integrity, we're all told that we're racist or we're in favor of Jim Crow laws. So, so let's talk about what does HR1 actually do? Do, right? You heard the intentions, you heard the grandiose proclamations about what it'll accomplish if we enshrine it into law, but what does it actually do? We don't write intentions, we write laws. So here's what it does. Post-election mail-in voting, right? So HR1 usurps state authority by requiring that every state accept mail-in ballots 10 days after the election. 10 days after the election. Now, there, there are certain provisions and certain provisions that are commonsensical, right? Like, so you have some states that have provisions that say, look, if a ballot is, if an absentee ballot is mailed in and it's postmarked, then, you know, we'll give it a, a, a couple days to still be counted, provided that all of the other legal requirements are met. Right? In a lot of cases, when you, when you do submit an absentee ballot, you might have to have a copy of a photo ID or you might have to have some other identification number that you've used to validate. In some states, they actually match the signatures of the person that signed the absentee ballot with a signature that they have on file. You know, it could be from your driver's license or something else. Right? So they, they, but they want to get rid of that. And, the, and then 10 days after the fact. So again, if this was something for hey, military absentee ballots that are coming in from overseas, we're gonna give them a little bit more time. I think most of us would look at it and say, that's reasonable. That's not what this does, right? It dictates to states that you will have this rule in place. So what does this mean for us? What does this mean for you as a, as a voter? Well, it means you go to sleep on election night, and generally speaking, we usually have a pretty good idea of who's won that election. Right? Maybe in, in some cases when it's really close races, I know about this personally, it may be the next couple of days or, or it could even last longer. But in the vast majority of cases, you, you know what the results are on election night. Now we're talking about a case where you're not going to find out potentially for another 10 days. And, and, and just to make sure we're clear, 
Imagine it's a really close race, and this is decided by like 50 votes or a couple hundred votes. We actually had a case uh, like this in, in a congressional race in Iowa. You've just told people that may have no problem engaging in, in casting fraudulent ballots that now that they know the score, they've got an additional 10 days in order to find the ballots they need in order to per put their person ahead. Now, the left will come back and say, well, that's ridiculous. It's all supposed to be postmarked. Okay, great. So what did you put in the bill that, that articulates the different rules for governing that, right? Well, it turns out they didn't do anything, right? HR1 does not require any standard proof that the, that the ballot be postmarked. Right, or, or that the ballot have the appropriate postmark before it can be counted. So you can imagine all the ways that you could essentially stuff a ballot box and say, no, 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 the, these, were, these were postmarked, right? Or that you can engage in some sort of fraudulent process. And you can just see it now, right? You can see it when these comes in and, and people come forward and, and challenge it and say, wait a second, I don't know that this is properly postmarked or this doesn't meet the proper legal guidelines. And then what is, what is every Democrat going to say? You're for voter suppression. You don't want these ballots to be cast. Well, no, we want legal ballots to be cast, but, but part of the process for ensuring that legal ballots are cast is that we have methods of determining that it was a, a citizen that is legally qualified to vote that cast their ballot within the time frame that they're permitted to cast it, right? And, and it's, I mean, most states have early voting now. You have absentee, you know, well in advance of elections. It's not like it is difficult to vote in this country. Right, but this is one of the provisions they're going to put on there. Okay, what's another one? Ballot harvesting. This is great. So for those of you that don't know what ballot harvesting is, I'm actually going to, I'm going to read it for you specifically. Under HR1, states must permit a voter to designate a person to return a voted and seal absentee ballot for counting. All right, so I want you to imagine someone, and, and what it also does is it bans all limits on the number of ballots a community organizer can collect. All right, so you have... A person that's going around on behalf of a particular organization, they have the forms right there. Here's my ballot. Here's my form authorizing me to turn in your ballot for you. I mean, they, they can literally go to a place and, I mean, now someone's showing up to your home. Now think about it. Some people say, well, that's convenient. Other people might think, oh, that's a little bit intimidating. Right? I, I have some, this is one of the reasons, like within union votes in, in businesses or whatnot that are considering unionization they, they really focused the idea of, of closed ballot, right? It was the idea that I don't have to like publicly tell you how I voted on something. Well, now you've got a situation where it's very easy to imagine how intimidation could potentially take place, where someone is showing up from a, from, and, and you don't, you don't got to fill out an absentee. You don't got to show up to the polls and vote. You can just, you know, hand out your ballot and hand it to this person who's now going to submit it for you. Well, there's again, two problems with that. One is, is just the nature of someone coming to your home or to your place of business or whatever it is and offering to turn in your ballot for you. That, that's the first problem, right? There, there's, there's certain problems associated with that. The other problem is that, okay, what happens to your ballot between when you hand it off to this person and when it actually gets submitted? I mean, are, are we really willing to say that, no, there's no chance there's no chance that a politically motivated organization that is fully invested in a particular candidate winning wouldn't manipulate ballots in order to make sure that the person won when they're turning them in on your behalf. Are we, I mean, are we really so naive as to imagine that couldn't happen? All right, and, and let's flip it, right? Because maybe someone on the left will say, well, absolutely not. You just, you just want to make it difficult for people that can't get to the polls to, to vote. Okay, great. So now the NRA is going around to everybody and collecting everybody's ballot at a gun show, right? Or, or it's a religious organization collecting everyone's ballot at a church and handing it in for them. Here's my question for those, for those people on the left. Are you comfortable with that? If, if it's the other side doing it, because that is what's going to happen. You enforce this state, you enforce this countrywide, then it, it no longer, for those of us that don't like ballot harvesting, which you've basically told us is, well, it, it no longer pays to stay out of the game. And so you're going to have conservative organizations doing the same thing. Is the left comfortable with that? All right. I'm, I'm willing to bet a lot of them wouldn't be, but you know, we'll see. But anyway, so ballot harvesting would essentially be imposed on the states. You, you have no ability to go to your state legislature and say, I don't like this anymore, like you currently do, because now the federal government is going to dictate terms to everybody else. All right. What's another one? Here's a great one. Voter ID ban. 
right? So HR1 bans voter ID laws requiring states to accept a statement from the voter attesting to the individual's identity and attesting that the individual is eligible to vote in the election. So you, <laughs> you want to commit voter fraud, right? Um, typically right now we have various mechanisms in place. Now, you know, Virginia has gotten rid of this, unfortunately, but one of the most common me mechanisms is to say, you know, here's, here's my photo ID demonstrating that I am legally allowed to vote. Now, in, in the states that require voter ID laws, like Virginia used to, we provided you a free ID for that, right? You didn't have to pay for it. You didn't have to do anything. It just, a lot of it was associated with either the DMV, but even if you didn't want to do it that way, you could get a free voter ID sent to you as, as a registered voter. Right? There, there was nothing to it. But now they're going to actually ban all of this. And now you just got to give a statement. Yeah, yeah, hey, I'm, I'm legally and eligible. I'm legally allowed to vote and eligible to vote in the district I'm voting. Take my word for it. Here you go. I, I, again, it, it's not that we want to make it difficult to vote. We want to make it very easy to vote. But by the same token, when you're talking about something that is vitally important as voting, right? And everybody, everybody on the left talks about how important it is to vote. And I agree with them. But what are we doing when we vote? We're deciding who's going to make the laws of the land and who is going to execute those laws. That's pretty dang important. And one of the things that's important to that, that entire process is ensuring that only people that are legally eligible to vote, vote. Because you want to know another form of voter suppression? Every time somebody casts an illegal ballot, they are taking away a vote from someone that cast a legal ballot. And if you create a circumstance, if you create a, a, a series of laws which greatly diminish people's, you know, feeling of, of um, confidence in the integrity of the election. It, it's, it's also a mechanism for discouraging them from even voting because why bother? Why bother? All right, what's another one? Speech restrictions. This is, this cracks me up, man. Every time I see this where, you know, the left talks about money in politics or they talk about, um, you know, some stuff I don't mind so much. Like when a candidate puts out a, a, um, an ad and says, I approve this message. Okay, I, I get that. I, I, I do. I don't, I don't think that's an overly burdensome way of telling a candidate that, look, take responsibility for what your campaign is saying. Don't have, a, you know, don't have somebody put it out and then say, oh, you know, it wasn't me. I mean, PACs still do stuff like that, but PACs and federal candidates for office are not allowed to coordinate. But what they're talking about doing is it, it, it's a complex disclosure requirements. And, and it goes even beyond this. So, for instance, let me get, I'm going to read this off for you. The bill additionally requires the disclosure of certain donors who donate to an organization generally if that organization later creates a campaign-related ad. So even if the donors were completely unaware that the organization would engage in that advocacy, they now have to be you know, put out there as donors. And uh, some people will look at this and be like, well, yeah, that, that's fine. If, if, a, if a group goes out there and they do a you know, advocacy on behalf of a bill or against a bill or a candidate, well then, yeah, we want to know who you are. The problem with this becomes what happens when the government then decides to punish people based off of how they donated. And if you don't think that's possible, well, we don't have to go very far back to look at how that was used. The Obama administration was specifically using the power of the federal government and different agencies when it came to organizations applying for things like 501c3 status. Right, and then going through and, and looking at you know where these people donated and potentially punishing them or delaying um, the recognition of their 501c3 as a result. You saw it too. You want to blame Republicans? Let's do it. Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon was famous for trying to use the IRS to punish his political adversaries. Right. So a, again, we're we're not we're not saying that th there are problems associated with donor disclosure when you have people within the government that are willing to use those lists in order to punish people for engaging in a form of political speech or advocacy, right? And, and that's the concern here because it, it even goes farther than that. It requires uh, public outlets to actually log all of the different you know, political statements and things that are made. So now you've got a situation where not only can the government potentially intimidate donors, but it can, inten but it can uh, potentially intimidate press outlets and, and require them to store all of this data, which again, show me under the, in the Constitution where the federal government has the authority to do things like that. You're not going to find it. It's one of the reasons why I believe this bill is not only wrong, it's only bad policy, but it's unconstitutional on a number of levels. All right, let's look at another one. Government dollars to politicians. Now, not only is the name of this bill somewhat shady, right? The For the People Act, as if 
you know, whatever we're going to do next is automatically for the people because we said so in the title. There was a, there was a, a common problem with this, and, and I ran into this in my congressional campaign and whatnot, where we were talking about taxpayer dollars to political campaigns. And the Democrats came back and said, no, that's not true. It's not taxpayer dollars. Okay, it's government dollars. So how'd the government get that money? Well, they're saying they're getting it through fines, right? So if you violate, uh, you know, FEC laws, Federal Election Commission laws, if and there, there were certain other, um, there's some other things with you engaged in them and you were fined, well, then that went into a pool of money. And then that money would then be used to finance political campaigns. So if you get frustrated every time you turn on the TV during the election cycle and all of a sudden you're inundated with multiple campaign ads, or you're tired of your mailbox filling up with campaign brochures and flyers, well, good news. Now the government's actually going to pay for that. And, and they like to say, well, it's not taxpayer dollars, it's fines and fees. Okay, well, here's my question. What would those fines and fees go to paying for if they weren't filling up my mailbox with campaign advertisements for candidates that I may or may not like or approve with or agree with? What would, that, what would those governments do? I'm hoping that maybe those government dollars would be going to something that, I don't know, is a um, legitimate function of government. But nope, nope, politicians are now going to write a bill, write a law, that gets that money back into their campaign accounts. Well, tell me that's not convenient, All right? And this was this was beautifully articulated by someone. Jenny Beth Martin in the Washington Times said, um, uh, you know, when when Democrats were saying this isn't taxpayer dollars, this was her quote. She goes, "Oh, okay." She goes, "This has a fancy schmancy dedicated financing stream based on surcharges on fees paid by corporate wrongdoers, so that its sponsors can say there is no taxpayer funding." But we all know money is fungible. If it weren't for the need to fund political campaigns, the money from this de dedicated stream would go to fund other taxpayer obligations. So let's just drop the pretense, shall we? And she's absolutely right. This is what it is. It, it's government dollars that should be used for legitimate functions of government in order to provide legitimate functions and services that the government is obligated to provide. But instead of doing that, it's going to go into campaign coffers. I mean, look, if you think there's too much money in politics, at least, at least now, if, if you want to get money for your political campaign to finance your TV ads or your, your door flyers or people to go knock on people's doors, at least right now you have to ask for it. But apparently we're just going to, you know, we're going to move that off to the side and we're just going to take it great, you know, right from the treasury, right? It's going to flow directly into your campaign. I mean, what's worse? I think you should have to at least ask someone to voluntarily contribute to your campaign, you shouldn't be able to rely on raiding the government bank account in order to pay for your annoying campaign ads. All right, so th that's just some of the problems, again, on a, on a fundamental level. All right, so assuming that all of this was completely constitutional, it would still be problematic because ra rather than, you know, making our, our voting system more secure and more accessible, it's making it less secure, right? So it's not assuaging the fares that a lot of Americans have. It, it's putting into place various voting laws that Democrats have been able to push in blue states, but other states don't necessarily want. And now anytime you disagree with them, they just accuse you of being for Jim Crow laws. Which, which by the way, when a Democrat accuses you of being for Jim Crow laws, remind them which political party actually instituted Jim Crow laws. Because, spoiler alert, wasn't Republicans. That was Democrats. In fact, as, as southern states became more Republican, they, became, they, they got rid of Jim Crow laws. All right. And they got rid of laws that were even, you know, associated with Jim Crow. So let's look at the constitutionality aspect of this, all right? Because some people, to include Stacey Abrams, they, they refer to the election clause within the Constitution as saying that this is why H.R. 1 is completely constitutional, because the election clause reads that the Congress alone is in charge of elections uh, for federal elections for the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives. Okay. So here's my question. If, if that is what you are resting the constitutionality of on H.R. 1, with, with its broad sweeping pronouncements of what's going to affect, here's my question. Does H.R. 1 only affect the election of representatives and senators? Nope. It also affects electors, the electors that select the president of the United States. So, so right off the bat, it's unconstitutional on those grounds alone. But then if you want to go further, again, just like we talked about before with all the First Amendment issues, where now you're going to require media outlets to, to log all of the different political ads and, and political statements, 
right? When, when you talk about, you know, we're going to go even further to say that we want to put donor information out there, even if they donated to an organization that, that put out an ad that they didn't necessarily, it's not like they supported that particular ad, right? There, there's all this other information that they're going to actually catalog and expose, right? You're, you're telling me that falls within, <laughs> that, that falls within Congress's power on federal elections with respect to senators and, and uh, Congress people? No. And in fact, if you, if you look at the whole reason why the states are responsible for election law, right? Because I, I saw a lot of conservatives after what was going on uh, during the 2020 election cycle, some of them were even saying, well, no, we need more federal control over election law. And I kept telling them, like, that's the last thing you want. One of the reasons why states have the authority to set up those laws, and again, they can be good or bad, but one of the reasons they have that is because it ties in to the larger objective within the Constitution that we have a federalist system, not a nationalized system, right? We have a federal government, not a national government. And sometimes these, these terms get used interchangeably. It, that's inappropriate. That's wrong. The federal government has certain enumerated powers that have been granted to it by the states through the ratifying conventions. Okay, and one of the reasons why we wanted to leave election law at the state level is because we didn't want Congress dictating election law, not just for the House of Representatives and the Senators, which you could claim under um, the Elections Clause, they do have some authority, not unlimited authority, but they do have some authority. But the idea that they would take over all election law? No, that's ridiculous. Uh, again, we are a republic of republics. The reason why we have a federalist system is because we don't want to create a situation where a select group of elites in Washington, D.C. are dictating terms to 330 million Americans. Right, so it, 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 goes against, it goes against the Constitution, not only in, in deed, but also in the spirit of what we were trying to achieve through this. Right, and, and this has gotten so bad, especially on the First Amendment side, that you actually had the ACLU weighing in. So let me read this off, right? Two ACLU lawyers um, came in and essentially said that you are, you are affecting the confidentiality. So they said, per a critical account by two ACLU lawyers, that would menace the confidentiality of a nonprofit that bought an ad criticizing House Speaker Nancy Pelosi or for supporting immigration reform or Senator Cruz for opposing the Equality Act that could, liter that could directly interfere with the ability of many to engage in political speech about causes they care about and that impact their lives by imposing new and onerous disclosure requirements on nonprofits committed to advancing those causes. What do they mean by this? Well, let's say you own a business and Maybe you, you support a, a particular piece of legislation that Nancy Pelosi supports, or you support a piece of legislation that Ted Cruz supports. And so, okay, you, you donate specifically to a particular purpose. Like, I, I agree with that piece of legislation. Well, now that's put out there, and your political opponents now attempt to cancel you, right? If you, we, we talk about what a problem cancel culture can be. Now we're talking about giving more ammunition to cancel culture through this. And even the ACLU understands that, look, this is problematic. We don't want to intimidate people away from engaging in the process because now all of a sudden it's going to mean that they're going to get an IRS audit, right? Or, or they're going to have their, you know, you know, business with a brick thrown through the window. And, and we've seen this. We, we've seen this in places. That there was a lot of stories out of California where, you know, somebody donated to, you know, something to defend the traditional um, definition of marriage. Next thing you know, they lose their job. Right. So, and again, I'm not saying a, I'm not saying a business doesn't have the right to fire someone for you know, the reasons they want to fire them for, but this is the sort of problem that we get into where we're actually quelling um, political speech. Or we're dissuading people from being involved because we don't want them to pay social or legal consequences for it. Not to mention the fact that when you get into the disclosure component of this, that becomes incredibly difficult to navigate. Now, all of a sudden, you got to have all these lawyers involved to make sure that something that you donated to you know, doesn't put you in a problem with either the, you know, Federal Elections Commission or the IRS or whatever else, because you thought, hey, I like that bill, I'm just going to support it, or I'm going to support a move to, to you know, uh, for a ballot referendum or whatever it is. Well, now, oh, you failed to disclose something. Or that organization, oh, they failed to disclose a particular donor. So now you got fines, now you got fees, now you can get in a lot of trouble. And then here's my question. And, and this is a legitimate question. Are the fees, you've made it difficult now for people to navigate the, the legal bureaucracy with respect to donations. So now you charge them a fee. Where does that fee go? Is that fee now going to be used in order to fund political campaigns? 
Because now if you just incentivize the government to basically hammer people for honest mistakes, not because they intentionally did something wrong, but because you've made a labyrinth of bureaucracy that they can barely navigate without legal advice, and now you're going to take their money in order to give it to your own political campaign? You don't see a perverse incentive for that? I mean, when law enforcement does this, when law enforcement gives you a speeding ticket and it goes directly into their, their coffers, or when law enforcement engages in civil asset forfeiture, and you've never been convicted of a crime, but they can take your property if it was involved in a crime, even if it was without your knowledge, and they can use that. We call that policing for profit. And it's generally something that we're trying to reform and get rid of. But now, what are we doing here? Now we're policing for political campaigns? Because it seems like this would be very open to that. Um, so look, the, the bottom line, the reason why all of this is important to you is because if you are concerned about the integrity of our elections. If you want to make sure that when you, when you go out and you vote, your vote is not being canceled by somebody that cast an illegal ballot, right? This law is going to affect your life. And, and if you are waiting for the media to honestly report on what's going to happen, I, I, all you need to look is the way that the media covered the Georgia voting laws. Because if you go through the Georgia voting laws, here's what you find out. They're less onerous than Delaware's laws. And for those of us keeping track at home, Delaware is where President Biden comes from, right? They're less onerous than a lot of other laws that we have in blue states across the country, but it didn't matter because the media narrative was that this was the return of Jim Crow. They decided to lie about you, not misrepresent. They lied about what Georgia voting laws actually did and what they did not do. And now they're not being completely honest with you about what HR1 does. But to go back to that favorable quote that John Sarbanes said when he said this would be transformational, he is correct. It would be transformational in a way that I would argue none of us want because it's not going to protect democracy. By the way, we live in a constitutional republic. We have democratic elections, but we live in a constitutional republic. And if you actually want to protect elections, that is a two-pronged effort. The first prong is make sure that it is easy and accessible for legally qualified citizens to be able to vote. The second part of that is make sure that you put in common sense laws so that we can be confident that it is one person, one vote. And I don't think HR1 does this. So it is bad from a policy perspective. It is bad from a constitutionality perspective. It is bad from a federalist perspective. And I think the last thing any of us would want to do, if we, if we really want to give the American people assurance in the integrity of elections, the last thing we want to do is hand over that level of authority to a bunch of politicians in Washington, D.C. All right, if you want to learn more about H.R. 1, I, I would really encourage you to go to the Heritage Foundation website. Heritage Foundation has done a lot of good research on this. They've talked about several of the points I've talked about here. They lay it out very well. They have numerous articles uh, pretty much going at this from a variety of angles, right? So again, I, I laid out three problems. I laid out the policy problem, the constitutionality problem, and the federalist problem. If you want to read more on that, if you want to learn more about why this is a bad bill so that you can call up your elected representatives, I mean, here in my district, we have Abigail Spanberger, who loves to go around talking about what a moderate she is, and now she wants to hand over massive amounts of power to the federal government in order to run all of our elections, right? This is something you need to be aware of. And do not trust the mainstream media when they report on this. Because they will report as far as for the people act. And then make you feel like anybody that opposes it is somehow anti the people. So, once again, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we got uh, some exciting episodes coming up next for you. For all of you who love the episode where Tina was on, we're bringing Tina back. And we're going to do a he said, she said perspective on a variety of political issues. One of the things that we're going to be talking about is what it was like for Tina to run as a conservative woman, right? And we, we talk about, you know, we, we, we see all this stuff on the left about female empowerment. Well, here's my question. How did the left treat Tina when she was running for office, right? And you're going to hear some personal stories that will absolutely blow your mind on this. Anyways, once again, thank you for joining us. And as always, please, Give us a like, give us a subscribe, write us a review, share this with your friends. If you want information like this to get out, if you want more people to be able to, to have a, a perspective that the media, that the mainstream media will not give you, right? we need to make sure that, that you know, 
broadcasts like this are able to get out to a wide audience. You are a huge part of making that happen. Once again, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Making the Argument.